Thank you. Uh, I love the weather. I came from Tennessee. We're at, uh, we have about 40 degree temperature fluctuations right now. 20, 60, back to 20. Anyway, I love this. Uh, my wife's a little jealous right now. She's, I left her home with four kids and came to California, so I owe her something after a bit. Uh, my name is Brian Glass. I'm working, I worked in IT and security industry for almost 20 years now. Um, last spring, I left consulting and I'm now a s assistant professor of computer science at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. And one of the things that I'm doing there is I've always looked at application security as more of a generational problem is if we don't get the next generation to come up with some mindset, we're always going to be bolting stuff on too late after they get into the workforce. So one of the things I'm doing there is I'm setting up a cybersecurity degree program within that school so that I can get more students trained and just across security, just trying to figure out how to get more out into the workforce by being able to take the years of experience I had and be able to impart into them, it's like this is what goes on in the workforce. This is not just a book that was written 15 years ago. This is what's actually happening. But you don't, you're not here to hear those stories. You're here because something said OWASP oh, SAM version 2. And there's been a lot of patience waiting for SAM 2 to come out and to actually catch up a little bit with the current industry. So we've had beautiful graphics in the past. Um, from Ugo, who does a lot of the graphics work for OWASP, and I thank him greatly for that. We have a fifth element that ended up being added to SAM for 2.0 that some of it we'll talk about. Um, who all is familiar with SAM? Most of you? Oh, good. Um, so SAM is essentially one of the very few things that exists out there that's actually a structured framework to try and give you guidance on how to build and improve a application security program or software security program, depending where you're from and what terminology you like to use. Um, similar thing happens with information security and cybersecurity. Just depends on your background and who you're trying to sell it to on which of the terms you end up using. So SAM is interesting where it does a good job or it's trying to help you understand where am I at and then give you guidance on where can I go? What are my options? What naturally progresses beyond this stage? Um, and one of the things that we're careful is it is a prescriptive model, but it is not a one size fits all model. Um, it just won't work that way. I really wish it did It'd make my life so much easier. If I could just be like, here, do this, you're done. Um, but it doesn't work that way. So one of the things I also wanted to bring up is who is Sam? So uh, Sam is right now, and, and I love this because in one five we had like around eight people, maybe five on the core team. Uh, we're up to 14 people that are constantly investing time. And it's their own time. It's not like company paid for time. It's their own time, nights, weekends. And it's across the globe. And some people stay up at 10 PM or two at midnight to make calls. Um, and they're just investing their time into it. And I love it because we get perspectives. We get very US-centric perspective here. And I love getting perspectives from South America and New Zealand and it, out of Europe and such. So that really helps from my, from my point of view to be able to understand what else is going on in the world so that we can see what happens. Um, and I bring this up so some people don't realize we still get a lot of people are like, I went to opensam.org and it has no updates. What's going on? What's wrong? Um, so OpenSAM was created back in 09. And it was a wonderful piece of work. It was just amazing the amount of effort that got put into it. And then it sat. And there wasn't any maintenance on it. And there wasn't anything keeping it up to date. And if you read it, you can notice that there are things that are absolutely came out of the waterfall development era. And so in a group got together, um, and we basically we forked it um, to, to be OWASP SAM. We just call it SAM for the most part, um, but it's technically OWASP SAM. If you look for open SAM, it's still 1.0. Um, OWASP SAM it went to 1.1, and then in 1.5, we didn't really change the model, but we changed the scoring system to be a lot more granular. And so the original model had a concept that everybody would follow a relatively linear path and you would build on each maturity level. 
Um, and you wouldn't get credit unless you completely fulfilled everything at, the at each maturity level. So you could have accomplished some of the tasks that are in maturity level two or three, but if you didn't finish that last one in zero, you get a zero plus score. And it was, it was setting some people off, and rightfully so. You weren't getting credit for the work that you were doing just because potentially within your organization or your technology stack, you didn't actually need to do that. Um, so in 1.5, we changed the model and we said, you know what, we understand that businesses, their, their organizations are just going to do it differently. And so you started getting credit for doing each individual types of activities, whether or not they were necessarily in any prescriptive order. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But finally, we're on, we're on the cusp of version 2 being formally released. It's on a um, community release at the moment, so it's out for feedback. Um, there'll be links and stuff to go. Please look at it, review it. I don't, some people have been keeping up with 2.0, like everything. Um, we have a GitHub repo, so it's wide open. If you look at stuff and you're like, hey, I really think you should improve this or I have input to put into there, by all means, please do. Um, there's only so many of us that have so many experiences and we're trying to leverage everything we can to make this better for everybody. Um, one of the, I, I like the quote, so, George Box is considered one of the greater statistical minds of the 20th century. And I love his quote because he said, the most that can be expected from any model is it can supply a useful approximation to reality. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's what we're hoping for with Sam is that we actually have a useful model. We can't make it match your organization 100%. It's just not possible. There's so, I mean, you know, as well as I do, the level of complexity in technology and software right now is insane. And there is no way I can build a system for you that is so hyper-tuned because I couldn't use it anywhere else. There are no two organizations that follow the exact same path, that have the same level of IT maturity, the same type of thinking, the same executive support, the same budget. So, um, core principles of SAM, these haven't changed still. But we, we have to understand that organizations' behavior changes slowly. I remember when I first started doing AppSec at FedEx, I had this naive thought that I could solve enterprise encryption in three months. It was on my roadmap, enterprise encryption, Q3. I blew through that and three years later we were still working on it. It's just, it doesn't happen quickly. And then it really depends on your organization. If you have a culture that lends itself to having that security mindset, you will make quicker progress. If you have to make cultural change to get security embedded in the things, you will make a whole lot slower progress, at least for a while. So if you have, I mean, and, and like I said, there's no single recipe, um, but also the guidance has to be prescriptive. People are looking for guidance on what to do. It's not that they can just be like, oh, I did A, I can now do B. Well, how do I do B? And then you start doing Google searches. And, I'm sure by now you've figured out that a lot of the results from doing internet searches don't necessarily result in good, solid answers. There's, I know, shocking, right? <laughs> There's a lot of information on the internet. The toughest part is A, to know how to search for it, and B, to know how to call it out to figure out what actually makes sense. Um, and then overall, I mean, and this is one of the things that we work really hard on, Sam. So if you find stuff that's like really confusing, please let us know, but it's really hard to take all of the individual examples we have and then distill it on to a higher level to be able to say this has to be relatively simple. Um, that's part of the reason, like in SAM right now, there's no waiting. If you look at, if you get into the details and you look at how the security activities are, there's no particular waiting of one activity has more importance than another. Because if we got into the complexity of waiting in the scoring system, the complexity gets goes up exponentially all of a sudden. So we have a, we've had people talk about possibly doing it, and you could do it in your own organization. But at this point, Sam does not do things like weight one activity heavier than the other. Because that you can end up with all sorts of strange stuff at that point, and that would take a lot of work to work through all the different scenarios of what might happen if we started weighting things differently. Within SAM itself, um, you have maturity levels, right? So you start with zero, which is like, I just haven't started. Um, three, I've rarely seen people at three. Honestly, you have to have a heck of a threat model for your organization to be hitting threes. 
That's not necessarily the goal for your organization. Um, most organizations I've gone through, the initial SAM assessment is actually a, somewhere around 0.75 to 1.2. And that's not bad. That's actually pretty good on average for if it's the first time you've ever gone in there. Um, and some organizations, and that's some of the tough part within SAM, is trying to figure out where do I want to go to. Because it's the same thing like if you've ever done Six Sigma or CMMI or something, you learn quickly that you're not trying to get max scores on everything. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually give you a good ROI. You're wasting money if you're attempting to get to a max score on everything. And as much as it pains me as a security guy to admit, any money you spend on security is money you don't spend on the business. So I need to be darn sure when I ask you to put money into my security budget that it's actually going to be well spent. So, and then one of the things, like I said, we added in 1.5 is in 1.0 and 1.1, all the questions were yes or no. So I'm pretty much made you lie one way or the other. Because if you answered, if I asked you the question, I was like, hey, have you done training for all the unique roles within your software development? And you've done training for developers, but not managers, testers. That, do you answer yes or no? Because if you answer yes, you're lying. And nobody's going to give you money to do that. Because it moves no bar. It moves nothing on a graph, nothing on a dashboard, because you already said yes. If you say no, then you're actually going the other way and you're not giving yourself credit for anything that you've actually put effort you've put into it so far. So we went down and we actually said, you know what? For coverage wise, you can have few or some. So yeah, we've done training for developer roles. We've done some of the roles that we've done custom training for, or at least half or many or most. Now notice this is not all, because again, I don't want you to have to lie on this. The chances of you actually being able to legitimately answer all to any of these questions is incredibly small. So that's why the highest level that I'm going to understand that you're going to get to is many or most. Because I also understand in the real world, it's almost impossible to have everybody trained. It's almost impossible to have every app covered for something. And so I just don't, I'd rather be realistic than to basically say, hey, we're just going to pretend it's all. Um, also notice that it's not a linear score because we also understand from experience it's a little easier to get started. It's a whole lot harder to get that last bit, to get that second half of stuff. Um, it's usually, most of the time, a lot of people end up in here. And not everybody gets there. And that's fine. And it may be unique to your organization. It may be unique to different parts. But it gives you some way so that you can get credit as you're making progress. The other thing we found that if you're going to do dashboards, right? Executives love dashboards. Double-edged sword, though, right? So if you put forth a dashboard and say, this is how I'm measuring myself, what do they want to see on that? Progress, improvement. Some number has to improve. You have to go up. You have to go to the right. Or, you know, that's our psychological. Up to the right is good, which is why this arrow goes up to the right. Uh, but you have to be really careful that what you put in the metric, that you drive the behavior you need to have happen to actually make that metric go up. If you start measuring the wrong things, they'll put money into the wrong place, and you'll start driving that metric up, you won't actually improve security. So 1.5, this is, if you've played with Sam, you've seen this, you know this. You have your governance over here. Uh, Nice, much more of the program level stuff. It's your policies, your standards, your metrics, your strategies. And then this says construction, but it's really more about design, right? So you've got your architecture, your security requirements, your threat assessment. Then you get into verification, and you're trying to verify that, hey, did I do things well here? Is it looking good here? And then you have running in the environment, operations in the environment. What's missing? We sat on down one day and we were like, you know what? There's something missing in here. No, that's down here in like issue management or operational enablement. I went from design to verification. There's nothing to actually write code. And so back at that point in time when this was done in 09, that really wasn't that much of a deal because you did a ton of stuff up front in Waterfall, right? Then you coded. 
Then you did a bunch of stuff to verify your coding. So there really wasn't a whole ton of activities in the middle there compared to nowadays, where all of a sudden we have this massive amount of work that's done in the, somewhere in the middle here. And that's what we realized, and we had a lot of feedback to like, hey, Sam's great. It's very waterfall language, very waterfall structure. Can we get it to kind of catch up a little bit? So we sat down a good bit, and we said, you know what? We may break some level of backward compatibility, but we have to get past four business functions. So Sam now has a fifth business function. We actually have implementation now. Um, and, there's a, and I'll explain some of the other things that ends up doing to us. But these are like the main, in terms of naming convention changes. There's minor changes within all of it, and I'll show you some of it. But we're getting into more verification. Now we're very more clearly about this is architecture, this is requirements related, this is security related. Um, build, deployment, defect management, a lot more related to that part of the development cycle. And then we rename this to be design. Um, and part of that's being a little cheeky because I've seen way too many examples in DevOps where design gets thrown out. Because they're like, we'll just iterate a design. We'll just keep writing code until a design comes out of something. We'll just build a whole bunch of requirements and then there'll be a design. Um, those don't work well over long terms. So I built this. Um, one of the other big things in SAM 2, so in 1.5, um, if you've looked at it really closely, you'll notice that a lot of the activities don't really relate to each other. They're like, you should do this, and you should do that, and you should do something else. But if you go and you look very carefully at how the maturity levels stack, it's not really like they're not following a common path or a common concept that says, as we grow, this concept matures. Um, so in two, one of the things we did is we basically broke it down to there's two streams for each of the activities within each of the business functions. And so within that stream is it's more stuff that's related to each other uh, as you push through. And so it's trying to, to build a little bit more of a cohesive relationship between the different pieces within SAM. Um, one of the things that you can do, and this is still here, this is what? Microsoft Excel. Because your number one security tool in use? Microsoft Excel. It works. It works a lot of the time. Sometimes for scale, it doesn't work. But for the most part, if you need to be like, hey, I need to do this ad hoc, it works great. If you need to send it to somebody and say, hey, fill this out, it works great. Uh, I'm, I'll explain some of the other stuff we're trying to do in the future. But within Toolbox, you, could, you have the questions. You have some guidance that helps you answer the questions. And it does all the calculations for you to be able to tell you, hey, this is where your score is. And then you can even have, um, there is a, a roadmap projection worksheet that you can say, hey, I'm going to put these activities in place. This is my roadmap over the next six months or the next year. And I will consider that phase one. And at the completion of that phase, you can predict your, the changes and the answers to your questions. So you can predict what improvements you would have to your score over time. So that helps you sell your program because you can say, look, I can show this improvement. You approve these projects that I want related to security to help improve our security. I can show you these benefits within the, the dashboard and the improvements. So this is one of the, like one of the dashboards within Excel that we have. And it helps you identify like where are we strong and where are we weak? Where can we fill things out and where are we doing well? For instance, this fictitious company has, is struggling in the education and guidance. And it may not necessarily say you have to do a ton there, but it may have you look at it and go, what's in here that may make sense for us to work? So there's a number of things within the toolbox. I didn't really want to break it out here. It's really hard to show Excel on a projector where that people can actually read. Um, so within SAM, and some of you know this already, I mean, getting that buy-in. I mean, at this point, if we don't realize that buy-ins from the executives and the stakeholders are absolutely critical to your success, it is. Uh, Risk-based approach, right? So we don't have all the money in the world. Um, 
we actually usually have very limited money. Um, but I mean, awareness and education, this is getting bigger all the time. We have a chance to be able to integrate stuff so that security just happens. And we're get, finally re getting past the point where we're like, hey, by the way, security is a unicorn. And we need to be the dominant thing in developer short-term memory. So we're going to send them to a ton of training. We're going to load up their short-term memory of all the things they should and shouldn't do when they're either designing or writing code. And we're going to send them off, and it's going to be great. And what happened was developers need that short-term memory to realize, how do I actually make this work in whatever language I'm working in? What was the business requirement I'm trying to satisfy again? How does this interrelate with the 47 other components within my application? There's no room left in there to cram like this massive amount of security training. So getting everything we can to like tooling to help them out within the IDE or within the language or frameworks to be able to help them do that kind of stuff. Sorry, I'm soapboxing a little bit outside of Sam. Um, so I added sorta in here. So historically, because everyone asks me this question. Everyone knows what BSIM is, right? Can SAM map to BSIM? Because we want a comparison of some, short, well, of some sort. Um, historically, it could. So I mean, look at the top here, right? I don't know if you can read it. It's a little small, but strategy and metrics for SAM. Huh, BSIM has strategy and metrics. Policy and compliance. Well, it's compliance and policy, but you know. Education and guidance, training. Threat assessment, attack models, security requirements, security features, and design. So there, you can tell, like, you, and you start wondering, it's like, hey, they're remarkably similar at one point. And they were at one point in time, because BSIM actually forked off of SAM before SAM was actually released. So at one point in time, they were incredibly close to each other. And over the last 10, 12 years, they've diverged. And the interesting thing is, is, has anyone ever read the BSIM document? Not like the report, but like the BSIM document that explains in detail each of the individual security activities within these categories. Did you notice some of the stuff they left? The Easter eggs are in it? There's about 50 or 60 fairly cheeky one-liners in that document. Um, Things along the lines of like tribal knowledge doesn't count as a defined process. Uh, a process that has never been used might not actually work. Uh, things like a WAF that's unmonitored makes no noise when an application falls in the woods. Uh, and so someone had fun. And it was interesting because when we were at a SAM summit, we were like at 1.5 going to 2, and we we're trying to figure out this hard problem of what about backward compatibility? Do we break that in two? Because that's why Sam's been 1.x for forever. We've been really careful not to break backward compatibility. And we're like, you know what? Let's, let's go past this high level. Because they're very high level in a naming level. It looks like these categories line up. What we found is if you went down to the detailed level about what questions are actually being asked within BSIM versus Sam at, um, as of a couple years ago, they actually had diverged quite a bit. Uh, and that's what got us into reading that document in terms of the details. And it's it like somebody's got a really good sense of humor. Like I, so I just extract, extracted like 40 or 50 of the little snarky quotes out of it. I just I appreciate it when somebody does that because I, I wonder because they do that because they're like, I wonder if anyone's ever going to read this. And I can tell if they read it because they'll come to me and be like, hey, I really liked this. Um, like I had a friend once who uh, was doing his annual review and he wrote, I will attempt to call fewer 1-900 numbers during workforce just to see if his manager actually read his self-review. Didn't read it. <laughs> but he just put it in there as a test. So beyond SAM 2, one of the other reasons why they had me come from Tennessee to talk about this is one of the things we're trying to do is we are launching SAM Benchmark. And so... Um, it's really, it's something that we've kicked around for two or three years now um, because the number one question we get with Sam, and it kills us, is how do I compare? Which is why the mapping keeps, they keep trying to recreate the mapping between Sam and BSIM because BSIM it actually gets published. Um, my struggle with BSIM is I've watched some clients beat themselves to death trying to catch up to BSIM numbers. 
And BSIM is like a top percent of certain companies within different industries. If you look at, and I may be misdoing it right now, but if you look at like the average software security group size in the results, it's somewhere like 13. How many people have a software security group that's like AppSec or software security? It's 13 people on average. That's a big group. I ran AppSec for FedEx, we had six. We had almost 4,000 developers and PMs, but we had six AppSec people. And so, I mean, that tells me that they're pretty large organizations on average. Now, granted, it's an average, and you could have outliers of like 40s and some that are fives, and you still end up with an average of 13. Uh, averages like to hide things. Um, but it's one thing for SAM is the, one of the advantages of BSIM is it's run by one organization. So they have a standard methodology for conducting an assessment. They have a central repository and they have a level of trust in the numbers. They're like, hey, trust us, we've collected everything, we've put it all together and we run the metrics. When you have something like SAM that's wonderfully distributed and open to interpretation by a bunch of different um, consulting companies, it's really, really hard to actually get comparable numbers. So one of the things um, that we're trying to do is we're trying to provide the ability to, like, the place to do this. Um, one of the things we want to be able to do is, comp is collect comprehensive data set to be able to help people answer those questions. What is working? Like for somebody of like some level of comparable um, attributes for me as an organization, where are they? What have they done? Um, am I doing well or am I seriously lacking? Because you can't really ask them, hey, competitor, uh, how are you doing on application security? They're not going to tell you. Uh, so one of the hope is, and this is what's been a serious part of the challenge of figuring this out, is that it's one thing for consultancies to submit the data. So they can create, they can have it in the contract or they can have it when they work with somebody and then they can aggregate it or they can anonymize it and they can submit data because I used to work for a number of them. And you could say, hey, I'm going to collect all this SAM data. It's anonymized. You cannot attribute it to any of the particular clients that we had and we'll contribute it. And the same thing happens with like the top 10. I work on the top 10 project too because there's similar data requirements and needs for them. And it's really easy for the third party to submit that data as long as they have approval because it comes from that third party source. And they're like, these are unnamed clients. And there's some level of un anonymous, I can't, anyway. Anonymous an anonymity, something like that. Um, so the goal is to try and, so OWASP has like a nonprofit Azure Cloud setup. And so the goal is to use that stack and basically do what we can. We tried three years ago to use Rackspace when we had somebody at Rackspace who could possibly do it for us, but he moved on and did other things, so we lost that contact. Um, so what we're doing, what we're trying to do is create a system, um, database, API, uh, a little bit of a front-end web app to be able to collect this data and then be able to let you run reports on it. Um, and the question that is the hardest one to answer about all of that, because that's just, that's writing an app, is how do we get people to contribute without being scared to contribute? Because for some reason, there's a number of organizations that feel that if they submit their SAM scores, somebody's going to be like, you know what, that organization has a governance score of 0.87, let's go after them. It, I'm sorry, but it's not really likely in my opinion for you to get chased because of a SAM score. Now I get it like if you're in CWE or CVEs or something like that where all of a sudden you're seeing like a stack of CVEs against a particular software product, you're like, hey, I'll bet you there's more. But if you look at like maturity scores of a software security program, I highly doubt that that's actually gonna be a trigger for different organizations to fall under attack. However, this is where the, unfortunately, the security industries love with FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, where we've scared everybody into hiding all of their stuff. Um, that kind of comes back and bites us. And we have a heck of a time getting people who are actually willing to contribute data. So we've gone through different scenarios, right? So 
back, kind of referring back to uh, Professor Stamos's keynote where he talked about if you have true animated, uh, did it again, <laughs> true anonymous people, it's really trouble, it's really hard to have trustworthy and verified data. So if I have somebody here like, yeah, I'll give you your data, but I need to be truly anonymous. I have no way to verify that data. Anybody could submit me that data. And so this, I'm tempted to leave this here just to try and like get people to do it and then realize that there's no real problem and then be like willing to say, okay, yeah, you can record who actually submitted this data. The other problem with doing this, where you're truly anonymous, is you can't actually maintain it. So the hope is, is that people can come into the system and they can be like, here's my one time, here's my six month follow up, here's my one year follow up. So we can start seeing trends about like, how fast can people make progress in different spaces based on what attributes, based on what piece. Uh, so this has been a struggle, it really has. And we've had a lot of discussions within the SAM core team about do we allow anonymous, do we not? Do we say everything's anonymous? But then we have a serious data integrity problem because we can't go talk to anybody and be like, your numbers are really strange, do you really have this? Or we get a flood of 130 submissions we have no idea where they came from. Somebody could totally be playing with the system and we just have no idea. So in reality, I'm trying to look at like, I'm hoping for scenario one. But I also understand, like if you've read the BSIM reports, all of the companies listed are not the total number of companies that they've interviewed. Only, even at the BSIM level, only some of the companies are willing to have their logo and their name put on the report that says, yes, we went through this process. It's somewhere around the third or so, I think, I'm just guessing, um, from the last one I read. Uh, but even at that level, not everybody's willing to let their name be known that they went through this process and their data is aggregated into that data set. So the concept that we we'll also want to be able to support is like, hey, we know, but we don't publicly identify. It's in the database, it's in the data set. If somebody managed to extract the entire data set out of the system, they could figure out who, which company had which score. Fine. So if there's somebody who's a little more paranoid beyond that, then you have the, hey, the core team knows who submitted, we've talked to them, but it's not actually recorded in the data set who it is. So even if the database is somehow extracted out and somebody goes, ha, 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 look, I'm going to publish, I'm going to shame all these companies from what we found. There's not actually a name in there to attribute that data to. However, we do know, like, as the, the moderators or as the, uh, I cannot think of the word. Anyway, people who are um, helping manage all of this and ensuring the integrity, we do know it came from a source. and We do know we've worked with them. We know it's legitimate as much as we can verify within somebody. So one of the things, like, and, and <laughs> this was killing me, I was hoping to have more of these up on the upper half, um, but right as of right now, um, you can submit, but you're basically submitting it to me, and I'm holding on to it for you at, the, at this point. However, what I'm working on um, is essentially building that application. And the intent is also that we're going to update the Excel spreadsheet, the toolbox application, so that it has the ability to do an upload um, so that you can work through it in toolbox and you can be like, you know what, I'm willing to submit this. And this is what I'm willing to submit. Um, and I'm fairly certain we can do that. Um, and that's also part of the reason why I don't mind going on the Microsoft stack for um, Azure and everything because then I'm actually more likely to be able to have the integration between Excel and the APIs and submit that up. Um, the, I've set up the data model in the system so that it can handle 1.5 and it can handle 2.0 because at the core level there's still enough similarities between the two that the system can actually hold data of both types. They're not directly mappable or they won't be. You've got a fifth business function. So um, my hope is, and it may not be out of the door in step one, the hope is to be able to give you an initial picture of what um, your V2 score would be 
for everything that was in 1.5 that's still in 2. They give you a jump point and say, hey, by the way, if you have 1.5 data, I don't want to basically say, you know what? <laughs> it's great that you all have been with us for the 1.1 and the 1.5, but too bad, start over. Um, so I'm doing everything I can to make sure that if you wanted to stay with 1.5 for a while, because you're comfortable with it. Because look, anytime you measure against a standard, there's a reason why that standard doesn't change every month. Because then you're trying to hit a moving target and it stinks. So that's part of the reason, like, I'm okay with Sam going through major updates on longer term cycles. Because to be honest, when you do that, that gives people that level of security to be like, I'm going to work against this. And it's also part of the reason why the top 10 is a every three year process. Because if we change the top 10 every year or every six months, do you think people would use it as a standard to measure against anymore? They wouldn't. Because think about the cycle for like vendors trying to catch up to the top 10. Because we realized this when we started doing 2017 that whatever we determined was going into here was going to take tens of thousands of man hours of all across all these companies to make changes to catch up to that. So if we change that on a quite frequent basis, the same thing applies to Sam, all of a sudden you're like, I was a 0.82, I was a 1.7, now I'm a 1.5. I didn't do anything. All of a sudden the measuring bar moved out from under me and I'm doing worse. We ran into that in pen testing, right? When your rules update and your SAS through your DAS and all of a sudden your code that looked like it was great, they looked for new things and all of a sudden, boom. You're like, why'd you do so bad all of a sudden? It's like, we didn't do anything different. <laughs> you changed how you scored us. Um, so anyway, so trying to do that. But the idea is, is we'll be able to store the questionnaire, store the form, store the model all within the system so you can pull it up. You can answer the questionnaire on the site if you want to versus using the toolbox. And then if you allow that, that it's known, right, so that we can associate you with it, you can log back into it, then you can go back and you can update it. And you can see your progress, you can see your trend, you can see your improvement. Because at the end of the day, what I really want to be able to do is have somebody come in and go, look, I'm a 150 person shop. This is my industry vertical. This is my general level of maturity of certain things. How do I compare? Can I pull up any number of other organizations that have done this before? Can I get any traction that says, look, our competition or other people in this space have an average of 1.8 across the board. We're 0.7. We're seriously lagging. Because what I want to do is I want to try and help people, one, get the, um, get the cred credibility they need to say, hey, we actually need to do better. Um, versus sometimes, because sometimes your management's great and they're like, you know what, I absolutely get it, you need to improve on this. Sometimes your management is like, what's security stuff? I mean, we, why do we care? Um, and I'm trying to stay away from the FUD, I'm just trying to get back to like, hey, so, you know, our competition's at this level, if we come up short, that's actually going to hurt our brand, that's going to hurt our future revenue possibilities. Um, and the other thing I'd love to do is figure out like, also the inverse, what never gets done? Is there may be activities within SAM that almost nobody does. We have this perception that they're what we should be doing, but I have no data that tells me, you know what, these things are actually a great idea. Um, and eventually I would love to get to the point where it's not just what, but how. And, and to where you could say, you know what, I do um, static analysis, but this is how I do it. Or I do RASP, but this is how I do it. This is what worked in our scenario. Um, even to the point where e potentially you could build collaborations, and it's usually like between industries, right? So when I was working at FedEx, we had a working group between Kaiser Permanente, Boeing, and FedEx working for like web single sign-on because we were using a similar product. We needed to learn from each other. We were in no way competitors, but we figured out like each other through conferences and stuff that we were each working with a similar product. I'd love to have Sam help facilitate some of that where people can be like, hey, we're not direct competitors, but we have a lot of similarities within our organizations. 
can we actually collaborate and be like, hey, how did, how did this work? Did, what kind of training are you doing? Are you doing security champions? Did that work for you? What did or didn't work? Because there are some companies I've worked with, their culture is absolutely, uh, they have a security champion culture. And it's amazing, and people volunteer for it which I hate to say isn't common in my experience, but they volunteer for it. They get really cool swag, They'll, and, and it's a badge of honor to have the sweatshirt from like the security ninja training, or to have the mug, or to have something, and they've turned it into a really cool thing within their culture. And, and I want to be able to get more of those stories out to where people understand, get some ideas, this might work for us. There's similarities in our culture. So let me get down to the nitty gritty, right? So what kind of data can we collect? And this is always the issue, right, that we currently have with semi-anonymous data is the more metadata you collect, the more likely you are to identify something, right? So what was it like a year or two ago where they said, hey, if you give me three receipts for somebody with a little bit of geolocation data, I can identify who this person is, you know, based on social media, the credit card transactions, and a few other things. So it's a challenge, it's trying to figure out like what is the data that would be useful to correlate for metrics between organizations, like what are attributes of different organizations, that would be useful that we think for reporting. So by all means, so this is up, um, uh, the URL's coming up next, but if you've got feedback on what else, so one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to actually bucket things. I don't want you to tell me, I have three people. I want you to say, I have one to five. Because in reality, the difference between three and four is probably not a lot, but the difference between one and 10 is. Um, and it's just trying to get some level of generalities in that respect. Um, but trying to figure out like things like, when was the assessment conducted? Because in all honesty, I not necessarily want to compare against data that's eight years old. I might want to compare against data that's, <laughs> no worries. Um, I, may, I may say, hey, in the last couple years, how have companies done? At this point, we don't have that problem because I don't have data. That's a future problem. And I'm trying to help future me out so that when people go, hey, some of this data is six or eight years old because that would be a dream that in six or eight years people are using this and we have the scale of data where you could be like, hey, I need the more recent data. Types of assessments, right? So there's a difference. If you've ever attempted to do a SAM assessment, your, a self-assessment versus a third party, I can tell you right now there's a difference. Because people are far more willing, and this is a weird thing about human psychology, far more willing to tell a third party that they've never met before all their dirty laundry. You want to guess why? Because they're probably never going to see them again. Yes, they're not related to their management. So if you have an internal person that comes in and says, hey, by the way, tell me what's worrying you. Tell me what doesn't work. Tell me what does. They're going to be like, well, it, things are pretty good. But if you come in as a third party, you're like, hey, tell me what, like, what gives you heartburn during the day. They're like, well, the PM team just does not get this. And, but they would never tell anybody internal, or they've attempted to tell people internally and it's gotten them nowhere. So they'll tell a third party because maybe they can help them. Because there's some power given by executives to third party consultants that they pay a ridiculous amount of money and they get a report. I can't tell you how many teams I've said, they're like, please, can you make sure this is in the report because we need it to go to the executive because they'll do something about it because it's a report that came from a third party. Um, just the notes and the things that come out of third-party assessments for SAM. Um, highly recommend, if you can do it, finding somebody that has experience in doing SAM assessments and letting a third party do it. It's absolutely worth your time. If not just for the score, for the notes. Make sure they give you notes. All the notes from all the meetings. And anytime I've done it, I've been careful to say we do not attribute any comment to any individual. So we don't say Jim over in sales said, you know, this stinks and the developers don't know what they're doing. We always say like, look, we met with sales. These are the concerns they have. This is the friction they have with other groups. And it's interesting because when you get multiple groups that work in the same processes, you interview them separately. And then you get their perspective. 
And so the exec may not have heard of anything. Okay, like, hey, this process is running smooth. And you got three different example, three different teams that work in the process. And they're like, it doesn't work because of this. And it doesn't work because of this. And most of the time, it's a misunderstanding. Or it's a misdirection of what is a priority. But anyway, so geographic region, things happen differently around the world. One of the things when I was working at Microsoft that was fascinating, we were trying to update the SDL. And we were getting ready to pull all the old stuff off. And some people over in Turkey showed up for the first time they've ever seen this. They're like, this is amazing. We're like, oh, we're getting rid of that old stuff. They're like, this is brand new to us. Please don't get rid of it. Like, this is where we're at. This speaks to us. So everywhere around the world is not the same. We're not at the same state. And that's one of the things I love about having such a diverse team on this project is they can be like, well, here in Brussels, this is the kind of stuff that we're running into. Um, so anyway, I, I absolutely. If, Feedback, please, I would love it. Um, so we have a separate, just because of the way we're running things right now, we do have a separate site for OWASAM.org. OpenSAM.org, you will just get frustrated with. Please don't go there. Um, almost everything we run is in GitHub. It's just wide open. Um, if you've got comments or thoughts or you want to pull it, put in a PR because you, know, you found something that you feel like you can contribute and improve, please do. Um, time, resources, uh, we had, I mean, on the previous slide, we have some sponsors because honestly, as much as it's all volunteer, it still costs money. Uh, it costs money to get help with um, icons and images and graphics because not all of us are Im imbued with the ability to do that kind of stuff. If you want to look at the benchmark stuff specifically, unfortunately, I didn't put it on that slide. I actually left it on this slide. It's actually slash benchmarking. I'm trying to get a link on the main page to the benchmarking stuff. Um, it's essentially a proposal. It says this is what we're going to do. And it's a little bit more detailed than what's in the slides. But it's what we're planning to do. So um, if you want to get a hold of me, I, I have the same thing for either OWASP or Gmail. Honestly, I check Gmail more often. But some people really like to only use the OWASP for some trust levels or something. My problem is my OWASP email is three quarters spam. So we'll now open the floor to questions. So you mentioned that SAM and BSIM diverged. Could you talk a little bit more how and maybe not why, but how? <laughs> so I, I think what happened, so BSIM describes itself as a descriptive model. So they're simply reporting on what people are doing versus SAM is prescriptive where this says this is we lay out where we think things should go. So there's definitely benefits to both. But BSIM continued to iterate on their descriptive model over a number of years. SAM sat stagnant for about seven years. And so BSIM had followed a bit of the changes within the industry because companies said we did this. And so they started changing to, mo to be able to model and continue with the direction that companies were going, where Sam said, basically just planted its feet and said, this is where I'm at, and this is where I'm staying. Um, that's a large, I mean, in general, the large categories stayed the same. Four business functions, three primary activities per function. But under that, the details changed over time. Thank you. Very enjoying your talk. And yesterday, I I I, I attend another session regarding the SVS, mm -hmm. and that OWASP SVS used to be a checklist. They are going to become a in the framework. Mm -hmm. And from you, things like the 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 Open SAM. I'm sorry. The OWASP SAM <laughs> is from every day. That's all right. From maturity model going to the framework as so well. So uh -huh. what's the relationship with or no correlation oh, between relationship the, between SAM and ASVS? Yes. So future. ASVS is like very specific. These are the controls you need when you do development. SAM is like this is the program from start to finish, from the concept of, hey, I need a policy that says I have to do security at my company, to how do I handle incident response. It's the entire front end. I mean, and we used to call it um, like development life cycle like traditional SDL, if you noticed, I changed the top to software assurance lifecycle because it's way beyond just pure development. 
It starts way before and it operates way after. Remember the old SDL diagrams are very nice and flat and they're like, hey, I have concept and I have design and I have, and then support was this tiny little box in the bottom right corner where actually the application spent the vast majority of its life in that tiny little box. But we were focused on development, not actually the entire assurance life, the entire life cycle of an application. So does that help answer? Yeah, I have a question along the same lines. So I'm familiar with the testing guidelines, right? And I think one of the earlier chapters, they recommend an SDLC, which seems a little bit different than, than what you've kind of put up there. So I guess, do you guys kind of partner in how to kind of shape that L SDLC to move more towards a standardized view? So, I'm sorry, I'm not, which SDLC? Uh, the, the testing guideline, uh, I can't remember what the full document is, but it's like on 4.0, but it, it's- Oh, the OWASP testing guidelines? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So in like one of the earlier chapters, they recommend a generic SDLC, which, you know, does define, design, deploy, maintain, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And in that, they recommend uh, testing, and they kind of, I think one of those pages, they list a whole bunch of kind of how you break things down and blah, 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 um, which seems slightly different than what you put up there. So okay. I, I like guess I'm kind of- I'm trying to think. I haven't looked at the testing guide in a long time. Yeah, so I guess my question is really more along the lines that I think you guys would benefit from, you know, kind of... Collaborating yeah, a little bit. Yeah, and doing some of that. Because they seem to have some things that you don't have. Okay. Um, it's yeah. entirely possible because yeah. ours is, a, is definitely at a higher level of these are the kinds of things. And, like, you can... Some of the details about control verification may get into some that's more of that. Right. But, like, I mean... The testing guidelines would be little pieces of it. Right, here. exactly. And yeah. I definitely understand where you're coming from. Uh, but I, as I kind of, you look and kind of compare mm -hmm. across the two, I think there would be an advantage in, in, in you know, learning yeah, from your peers. Yeah, I, right? I absolutely think you're right. And, and we've done some, of, we've run into some of the same stuff between the top 10 and ASVS as well. I'm trying to make sure those are in alignment. Because the larger and the more involved the OWASP projects get, the more they need to actually work together. Because the last thing we want to do is give different advice in spaces. Um, so, anything else? So one of the things that I've found, uh, you, which I've found a little bit harder to use with Sam is comparing between our own journey. Okay. Um, so for that, we've ha had to do assessment sort of twice. Is, th uh -huh. is there a plan to have that in, within one uh, sort of sheet so that I'm just getting into the nitty gritty, you, you, but you're basically. looking at trying to figure out the deltas. Yeah, yeah, the deltas and, between and, our and own every uh, every six months when we went and tried to do that back about, yeah. a, about three months back when we, when I did that after a year, we just figured out that oh now I have to like fill another time instead of having to do it within the same. So, time, so. so one thing you can do at least short term mm -hmm. is within the roadmap tab you have this is where I'm at now from my assessment, and then you have. Phase one, two, three, four. They're not time bound, they're just phases because everyone, I need to give you the flexibility that my phase may not be like an annual thing or a quarterly thing or it just whatever time box. My goal with the application, the web app, is to be able to have you do that. You can, at whatever point in time you come in, you say, I need to update some of the answers to my questions. These, this is what it is. Can I see, like, as yeah. I go, what's my progress improvement? What's my velocity in certain areas? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I, that's something near and dear to me that okay. I want to, because I know it's a challenge. Yeah. In an Excel spreadsheet, it's absolutely a challenge to be able to compare versions. So. Right. Any more questions? Okay, so I actually have a little suggestion <laughs> for you. Um, so one thing you were mentioning with uh, data collection for Sam, mm -hmm. uh, maybe one thing you could look into is maybe Google Forms, but I don't know if you'd want all that corporate data to surface on Google. Well, that's, so that's one idea. Well, and that's part of the reason why we're basically writing our own. Yeah, but is. one thing is, is that if you do collect your own data and then you want to submit results, you can actually look into anonymization techniques like differential privacy mm -hmm. to release some of that data, and that's kind of one new metric that... Um, a lot of big corporations are using now to anonymize data. So okay. Google just released a new framework for differential privacy, uh, which is open source. So okay. that's something that could be looked into as well. Cool. Um, also, one question is is that this I've kind of noticed a similar overlap with a lot of like the DevSecOps model is that where you kind of get some of the influence in um, Sam V two. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. 
and that was part of like we've looked at we looked at a number of DevSecOps models. We had somebody who, on his own, tried modifying Sam to do some of the DevSecs. He built like a DevSecOps maturity model, and so we compared a lot of those things together to try and work out like what made the most sense in here. And like I said, it's a model. It's not perfect, but the more feedback we can get from different folks based on their experiences of what worked and what didn't in different spaces can absolutely move that forward. Okay. Can we get a round of applause, please?